The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today we are going to discuss color vision and adaptation. About two-thirds of it is going to be color vision and one-third on adaptation. Now, I'm going to have several demonstrations on the screen here for you. Um, and I would like to forewarn you that for some reason, they still haven't fixed the, uh, the light uh, bulb in this projector. And this, you see this is a bluish color to it, speaking of color vision. And actually, it's supposed to be gray. But there's some loss of balance there in this um, bulb. And they've promised to replace it uh, something like 10 days ago, and they, it still hasn't happened. But uh, so once we come to the demonstrations, they're not going to be perfect. Uh, but um, they will also be available on the internet as well as yeah, uh, on, on Stellar. So you can look at them there, and maybe you'll get a better picture of them there than here. But we'll do the best we can. All right, so anyway, uh, let me first give you a list of things we are going to discuss and the questions we're going to pose. First of all, we're going to ask, what are the basic facts and laws of color vision? Now, one of the nice things about color vision is that there are number of laws. It's a very basic phenomenon. And it's, uh, in many ways, very close to physics. The second one is, what are the major theories of color vision that we are going to discuss? And then we're going to examine how color is processed in the retina and geniculate. Then we're going to move on and examine what happens in the cortex. Uh, and then we are going to discuss what is the nature of color blindness, which I think will be of interest to most of you, because color blindness is not that uncommon, unfortunately, uh, among humans. And then we're going to look at how adaptation is achieved in the visual system. That's when we switch from uh, color to adaptation. And then we are going to ask the question, what are after images? How are they produced? And what are, the, are its effects? All right, so let's begin then with color vision. And uh, the first thing I would like to say about this is that, as so often happens, uh, in, in the course of history, uh, often there had been great misconceptions about uh, color. And one of the great misconceptions was that uh, people thought that white light is the pure light. And that was exemplified in the fact that uh, uh, before the 20th century, uh, for example, uh, most nuns were required to wear a white outfit. And they were asked to wear the wh white outfit because it meant that they were pure. So what happened then uh, uh, in the 1600s, one of the greatest geniuses of our time came along. That was Newton. And at that time, this is an interesting coincidence, uh, it, it happened that uh, the art of making chandeliers has emerged. And the chandeliers, in those cases, were consisted, consisted of little pieces of glass cut in various ways. And people noticed that, uh, and so especially did Newton, that when you looked at these uh, chandeliers, you saw all sorts of colors there. And so Newton said, my god, what, what, how can that be? What's going on? And so he began to analyze uh, color, which also came about then for him, because that's when they also, in addition to the chandeliers, they came up with prisms. Okay? And so what Sir Isaac Newton did was, uh, let me skip this for a minute, and I'll come back to it, uh, what he did was that he put a little opening in a screen and let the light come through from the sun, white light. And then he put that beam of light through a 
uh, a prism, and he discovered that he got an image much like what you see when you have these uh, chandeliers, namely that you get all sorts of colors projecting out of the uh, <coughs> prism. And then he performed yet another little experiment. He added another prism, same kind of prism, where the light was separated for the red, and then there was no further separation. Okay? So that was a remarkable discovery on his part. And he became interested not only in the physics of it, but he also became very interested uh, in how we organize our color perceptions. And he, he was the first person to come up with what I will talk a lot about, the so-called color circle. All right, so this is what uh, Sir Isaac Newton then came up with. And he established that we have a huge range of frequencies, frequencies and a very narrow section of it right here is the one that falls into the visible range. And if you break that up like this, enlarge it, much like a, the colors of a rainbow, you see all of these colors. And so the conclusion to which he came is uh, something that was quite remarkable. He was at, at that age just 29 years old. Um, and that was done to go back here at the age of 29 in 1672. And so he concluded at that time that white light is a mixture of all the colors. It's white because it's an equal mixture of the different wavelengths here. Okay, So rather than being pure, white light is a conglomeration of all the little wavelengths in the visible range uh, that the eye can pro uh, process. So that was so stunning for him at the time that he delayed publication of it for, for more than 30 years. And then when he published this, this was extensively debated even 30 years later. And one of the people who debated it a lot was a famous German poet called Goethe. Uh, you probably, all of, all of you know who he is. Uh, and he said, ah, Newton is a charlatan. He just made this up. It can't possibly be so. White light is pure. And so what he did, he went, he took a prism just like uh, Newton did, but instead of reflecting the light, he looked into the prism towards the, towards the light, and he didn't see any colors. And he said, ah, yeah, Newton is all, all, all full of junk. Uh, and so he asked his associate at the time, Schopenhauer, who is also a very famous uh, philosopher, um, and said, why don't you do some experiments? Let us prove that Newton is all wrong. And so Schopenhauer did the experiment right and said, oh my god, Newton is right. Uh, what am I going to do? How can I tell Goethe, my boss, that he is wrong and, and Newton is right? So that became quite a uh, thorn in his, in his hide at the time. Um, but of course, eventually, we all came to recognize, indeed, that uh, this is the situation and that white light is a mixture of all colors. So let me now go back a minute to uh, some of the basic facts, which I will elaborate on as we proceed. First of all, when you talk about color, there are all kinds of systematic things that we are going to discuss, and you're going to become educated about processing of color as a result, because we know a lot of very important basic facts about it. It's solid science. OK, so when we talk about color, we typically make a distinction between hue, brightness, and saturation. Hue means what is the color? Is it red, green, and blue? Uh, brightness is how intense the impression is. And saturation is that some, that every color can be kind of washed out, or it can be very sharp. OK, you can see a, a bright red, or you can see a really washed out red that's very different from the background. All right, so then um, the, you have to make a clear, this is very important, you have to make a clear distinction between the psychological and physiological uh, 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 attributes, the physical actually, attributes of color. So what do we mean by that? Um, when we talk about color, that's an impression we have. That's our own personal psychological experience. 
But the scientific way to look at it is to call it wavelength. All right? The same thing is true for luminance and brightness. Now, before, now before I go on to this, let me back up for a minute. Uh, here, let me say one more thing about this. Um, because it's an interesting way to remember it, and also it's relevant to what you're going to hear in the second half of this course, which is going to be on audition. So here's a classic question people have often been asked, especially when you were still in grammar school or maybe even in high school. It was, when a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody around, does it make a sound? And so people debate this and debate this and debate this. Well, from my point of view, there's no question there at all. When a tree falls in the forest and there are all these cracks and everything, there is no sound, because sound is a psychological attribute that we hear and interpret. There is, of course, a production of wavelengths as a result of the fall, so that's up in the air there. But you need a human being to turn that, that uh, free, various frequencies into what we call sound. Okay? So now, the next thing I would like to briefly approach, and we'll talk about it in much more detail in a minute, is that it's been established by now, but initially there was quite a debate, I'll come back to it, that we have three major kinds of uh, cone receptors in humans and in many primates, and actually in some animals, in some birds, there are actually four of them. And these three are the uh, uh, short, middle, and long wavelength cones, uh, of course, we can call those for short, we mean blue, uh, for medium, we mean green, and for long, we mean red. And then we have the rods, uh, uh, and these numbers here, this one is misspelled, this isn't BB, I don't know what the BB is. At any rate, these are nanometers, all right, at, we, at which they peak. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But before I go on with that, let's imagine for a minute, let me skip this, uh, suppose that uh, you are uh, the emperor of the universe since the uh, beginnings of time, 1,500 million years ago. And you decided that um, you're going to create animals. And once you created animals, you decided that they're going to have to see things. And so they have to have an eye with which to see. And then you have to decide, well, if that's the case, uh, color is very important. You looked around the world and said, oh, all these beautiful colors. How are we going to have these animals and these humans see all the colors? And then you said, well, hmm, uh, there are hundreds of colors. So what are we going to do? Are we going to create a receptor for every one of these colors and put them in the eye. And you said, oh dear, that's a problem because then we would need, need a gigantic eye. And so the question became, of course, what, how, how else would you come around this? And so here was the idea that here you have sensitivity and here you have wavelength. And so the idea was that you could create hundreds of very sharply tuned photoreceptors like that so you could get all the colors. Well, that didn't uh, uh, seem to, did not seem to be a very good way of doing things. And so getting more back to the present time, uh, still a long ways off from, from the present, actually, people began to hypothesize about this, say, well, what can we do to minimize the number of receptors with different sensitivities color and still be able to see well? And so. One theory that came up before they knew anything about the eye and, 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 and the three photoreceptors, cone photoreceptors, Young and Helmholtz came up with the idea that if you had just three types of cones that are broadly tuned, uh, they could take care of most of the ability to see various colors. And so that became a very interesting, very, very powerful theory and actually, speaking of theories and models, it still is, in my mind, probably the greatest model of theory that has ever been developed about how the brain works. Because it subsequently did turn out that, indeed, there were three of these 
receptors that are broadly tuned that can provide all that information for you. And that actually, as you will see, become, became a huge issue. Okay, so let me now, sorry, let me go back for a minute to uh, this, and let me just reiterate, these are the uh, uh, nanometers for the uh, three types of cones, and at the, bar, at the end here we have the nanometers for the rods. Then, uh, as a result of analyzing all this stuff, people have come up with all sorts of rules and laws, and that's what is one of the nice things about color vision. And one of the rules is called, uh, actually laws in this case, is called Grassman's laws, okay? And he said every color has a complementary, which when mixed properly yields gray. And I will explain this to you in just a few minutes. And the other is that non-complementary colors yield intermediates. Um, just keep that, keep that in your head for a minute until I fully explain it. And the other law, which uh, I'm not going to talk too much about, is that the luminance of a mixture of differently colored lights is equal to the sum of the luminance of its components. So these are very, very basic rules, laws. OK, so here we go again and uh, move on. Here is what is called the CIE chromaticity diagram that was initially devised in 1931. And let me, let me explain to you how this came about. This became an international undertaking. And it came about because it was highly desirable to be able to communicate throughout the world your particular color desire or experience. So for example, if you had a particular uh, hat you had bought, say a blue hat of some sort, and they said, now I would like to get a dress that fits it. How can I do that? Well, what you can do now as a result of this chromaticity diagram, uh, there's a scale here. You can see the vertical values and the, and the horizontal values going from zero to close to 100. And then, if you can specify a particular color, so you want this color here, you simply can state what that color is by giving it the number, all right? And then you can send that number to China or to, I don't know, to South Africa or something, to a particular company and say, I want to have a, a dress like that with that color. And then because this is international, they were able to produce that color as you specified on this diagram. So that was a very powerful undertaking. And this arrangement is such that actually the colors go from the center outward, become more saturated. Take, take for example, from going to here to here. And the center of this, which is about 333, 333 uh, on, on, on the diagram, is white, which is not that obvious here, partly because of the colors of the background. So that is the uh, famous uh, 1931 chromaticity diagram, and what can do, one can do with this is to super, superimpose on this some rules about you, the human or, say, the primate color vision abilities. And the person who came up with this, as I've mentioned, was Newton. He came up with a so-called famous color circle. Now, the color circle is described here, okay, and I'll show it to you in just a minute uh, the head on. Uh, this, this is green, this is red, this is yellow, this is blue. And of course the question is why do we have them set up in this fashion? And we'll explain that in just a minute. Okay, so here is the color circle, two-dimensional color circle, where things are pretty much equiluminant across it, okay? Now, if you go from the center out, you increase saturation, as I had already said, and as if you go around, you change hue, all right? So those are the basic attributes. Now, to anticipate the issues here, let me tell you this. This is yellow, this is blue, this is green, and this is red. These are called the cardinal axes, all right? Going, as long as the line goes through the center, that's a cardinal axis. These are the ones which are best known, the red, green, and blue, yellow. <clears throat> And the fascinating fact about this is that this explains a number of very interesting facts about our ability to see colors. 
So let me tell you this. If you mix yellow and blue, as we had talked about the law, if you mix them in equal uh, uh, luminances, you get what's in the center here, you get white. Furthermore, be, and because of this, there is no such experience in our existence that's called yellowish blue. And there's no such existence in our minds, as far as color is concerned, that's reddish green. On the other hand, if you don't go across the center, but you say you have yellow here, and you have green here, there's a, there is yellowish green. There is yellowish red. There is bluish red. And there is bluish green. So we can process those and see those in between colors, but we cannot do that along the cardinal axes. So this incredible uh, color circle essentially explains the very essence of how we can see color. Now there's one more factor here, is that we also have to take into account uh, luminance values. And so people turn this uh, color circle, for some purposes, into a three-dimensional entity that's shown here. Here's a color circle. And uh, the third dimension going up and down here is you go from, very, from white to black, if you will, in the center. So here things are brighter, and here things are darker. So that is sort of a complete, then, arrangement for uh, your color impressions. But what we are going to do, we are going to concentrate on the color circle itself as we move along. All right, so now let's next turn to the outgrowth of this, starting with Newton's color circle, which is then somewhat modified uh, uh, in the manner that I had just shown you. And as a result of all this, uh, a number of competing theories have emerged. And I'm going to talk about two of them. The first one is the famous Young-Helmholtz theory. And Young, and he Young in initially, and when he co collaborated with him many years later with Helmholtz, came up with the idea that you could experience colors by just having three uh, types of cones that are broadly tuned. And so he said, there are three types of broadly tuned color receptors. The color experience is a product of the relative degree of activation. Now, that's a fantastic theory, but there's a big problem with it. The big problem with that theory is that it doesn't explain uh, Grassmann's laws. Remember what it's Grassmann's law is? That if you mix things along the cardinal axes, you get white. And you only get other colors when you mix them uh, not along the, the axes. So that became a problem. And because of that, uh, another famous uh, person, Herring, uh, came up with an alternate theory. He came up with a theory which said that uh, color opponents is based on the observation that red and green, as well as blue and yellow, are mutually exclusive, just as I had said. The nervous system probably treats red, green, and blue, yellow as antagonistic pairs, with the third pair being black and white. That's where the third dimension comes in. So therefore, he argued that we need something like color opponency to be able to see colors right. Now, the interesting thing about this is that he became very famous coming up with this incredible theory. But then if you go back in history, uh, you find that Leonardo da Vinci had the same idea many, many, many years before that. And this is from his autobiography with a very poor translation. It says, of different colors equally perfect that will appear most excellent, which is seen near its direct contrary, blue near yellow, green near red, because each color is seen when opposed to its contrary than any other similar to it. That's, it's not written in English, really, but you get the idea. All right, so we have these major two theories. And then numerous experiments subsequently emerged, especially when it became possible to record the neural activity of cells to determine uh, to what degree these theories are correct. And of course, the first correct aspect of both theories was that indeed we have three types of cones that are selected to red, green, and blue, and that they are broadly tuned.
Now, so to now understand better how it really happens in the nervous system, let's take a look at the basic physiology of color processing. All right, I showed you this slide once before. I pointed out to you that contrary to red and green cones, blue cones are much less numerous. Only one out of eight are blue. And if, furthermore, if you look at this on the retinal surface, this is the foveal area, there appear to be very few uh, blue cones in the fovea itself. So the blue cones are less numerous, um, and consequently, uh, it became a puzzle of how do they contribute to color vision. Now, to exemplify this further, uh, let me show you a slide here. Uh, here what we vary is the spatial frequency. And what you can see is, I think most of you probably don't see anything here, but you most of you probably still see this, right? This is the same spatial frequency as this, but this activates uh, the blue cones mostly, and this activates your uh, red cones, all right? And you can see that your acuity is much, much lower when you only have your blue cones available, all right? And that's because only one out of eight blue cones uh, exist on the, in the retina. So there's this very, very clear distinction. All right, so now uh, let's talk about the photoreceptors. Uh, here we have the, uh, an absorption sp spectrum, or I should say a, a series of up absorption spectra for the uh, four kinds of photoreceptors, and the fourth one is your rods, okay? So what you see here, that each of them are fairly broadly tuned, okay? Uh, here we have nanometers, all right? And I'm sure all of you know this already, that one nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So we're talking about incredibly, incredibly high uh, frequencies. Uh, so that the important thing to remember here is that the, each of these cones is fairly broadly tuned. And so consequently, any light that comes into the eye tends to activate uh, all of the cones unless they're at the very extremes. And so indeed, as Young and Helmholtz had proposed, it, somehow we have to derive our color experience from the relative amount of activity from these different cone types. But then, as I've mentioned to you, uh, Herring felt that that was not sufficient to explain our color abilities. And so they did, what he did then is to move on and had people, especially more, much more recently, examine more closely what the center surround organization is of uh, the different uh, midget cells in the retina. And if you remember, initially I told you that the prime theory was that the center comes up, is comprised in central retina of just a single cone, and the surround of its color opponent cone. But then when people began to study this very carefully using a combination of recordings and anatomy, they found that actually the surround is not specific to one type of cone input. It's mixed. And so then people began to model that, and they found that this arrangement is almost as good as this arrangement. And this is the truth, actually. That's how it is. And so uh, then, just to remind you, uh, the parasol cells have a mixture of, of, of these inputs, both in the center and the surround. And as we had discussed, uh, the parasol system cannot tell you about colors. This I mentioned to you before. The major system gives a more sustained response than the parasol system. OK, so now I also showed you this diagram. And we established that the green and the red cones each give rise to an on and off system at, uh, at the level of the bipolar cells, and then give rise to the on and off ganglion cells, the red and green on and off ganglion cells. Now, the blue system is more complicated uh, because you don't have a, f if, you had f if you would have had four di different kinds of cones, um, meaning uh, a blue one and a yellow one, then probably would have had a similar arrangement. But nature somehow had uh, 
failed to create a yellow cone because it felt it was not necessary. Because if you have an equal mix of red and green, you get yellow. Because remember, they're, they're not on opposites, OK? Uh, sorry, that, that they're on opposites. But if they mix them, uh, you can create an impression of yellow because they're not along the the exact axes for the colors themselves. So the argument was, therefore, that you must have uh, yellow on, blue on and blue-yellow uh, on ganglion cells. But whether this is really the case is still, to some degree, debated. People have done a lot of recordings. Uh, and much of this was done not only in the retina, but also in the lateral geniculate nucleus. And so the question was, let's just find out. What is the color tuning of cells in the lateral geniculate nucleus to understand this? And to do this, one went back to the color circle and presented stimuli along the color circle to the receptive fields of these cells to see how they responded. Okay? And here's an example of a so-called blue on cell. It shows here as you do these different colors, the cell is tuned, okay? Sharply tuned, mostly to 90 degrees. A yellow cell is the opposite, and a green off cell here, and a green on cell here. So what happens then is when you take a large sample of these, huge sample of them, what you find is that in the lateral geniculate nucleus, you don't get any cells that are at the diagonals. All the cells fall into these major four categories along your cardinal axes. Yeah? And then if you take a big, huge sample, you come up with the following summary, that you have red on cells, red off cells. You have green on cells, you have green off cells. And at least some people claim that you only have blue on and yellow ons. You don't have blue offs and yellow offs. That is still under debate. Um, but certainly, if you do extensive recordings, if you find any off, blue and yellow offs, they're extremely rare if they exist at all. OK, so now, to try to gain yet further understanding of the role various areas play in color vision, is that one can make lesions. And I've already told you what happens when you make a lesion, either parvocellular or magnocellular lesion, that blocks the parasol or the midget systems. And that the midget system is essential for color vision. And then I showed you this here. Um, here's a geniculate. If you take out this area, you block the midget system. And if you take out this area, you block the parasol system. So if you do that, here's an overall view of the monkey brain. Here's area V1, here's area V2. And here's area V4, which I've mentioned to you before, had been believed to play a central role in color. So then it becomes important to see just what happens when you make lesions in these areas. In this case, you can make a lesion in V4. And then we can examine color discrimination. And I told you in a monkey what you do is you use an oddity task. After fixation, you can present the odd stimulus either in the intact parts of the visual field or those that, uh, that had been lesioned. Okay? So if you do that, this is a high contrast. And if you do that experiment, I showed you part of these data before. I showed you that after a lesion of the parvocellular geniculate, which uh, blocks the midget system, you totally lose the ability to discriminate even these high colors, red, green, and blue. Okay? But no deficit arises when you make a lesion in the magnocellular portion of the geniculate. And then the big question became what happens in V4, uh, since that had been for decades dec been declared to be a color area. And what was surprising about that 
is that after V4 lesion, there was only a small deficit in color for this high contrast stimuli. So therefore, people had to go on and do a more careful detailed study to see what happens if you use less saturated colors. Remember that the degree of saturation is one of the important factors for analyzing color. Okay? And here we have an example of a very low saturation, and here we have a somewhat higher saturation. And you can vary that systematically and see what happens after V4 lesion and after other kinds of lesions. And here's an example of what happens with V4 lesion, and this is what happens with an MT lesion. It shows no deficit at all with an MT lesion, indicating that MT does not play a crucial role in analyzing color. We do get a significant deficit here, but it's a small one, okay? So even at low saturations, uh, the monkey still can do colors reasonably well. So it's not like V4 is the color area. There apparently are several areas in the brain that can process color, and V4 uh, does that in addition to uh, performing several other analyses that we will discuss uh, in a couple of sessions from now. Okay, so now uh, we're going to turn to another very interesting phenomenon, which is what is called isoluminance. What is isoluminance? Isoluminance is the presentation of different colors that have the same, the, the same illumination level. Okay? So I'm going to give you a few examples of this. If you look at this, how many of you can read those, those words there? Pretty tough, isn't it? OK. Uh, this can be set up in such a way that it's even worse, but because the, of the, of, of the uh, light bulb in there, it's not really perfect. But just to give you a sense of it, obviously those two are a lot easier to read. Yeah? So that's because this is close to isoluminance, at which our ability to see objects is much impeded. Not eliminated, but impeded. So what can you do to do this kind of experiment systematically? What you can do here is you can use various uh, capabilities, stereopsis, motion parallax, not just motion, and texture. And if you do that and you vary the red-green luminance ratio, you can see that there's a dramatic drop-off uh, at around very close to a luminance ratio of 1 and 1. Okay. So indeed, our ability to process information in the absence of luminance information is greatly compromised. Uh, so then the question came up. I mean, we're talking about here uh, uh, such things as motion perception, texture perception, and stereopsis. And as we had discussed before, we have already established that texture and stereopsis uh, are processed to a large extent by the midget system and that motion, to a large extent, is processed by the parasol system. Now, but all three of these types of capabilities are compromised at isoluminance. So a series of experiments had been carried out in which people argued that when you present stimuli at isoluminance, you uh, render the parasol system uh, unresponsive because it gets equal input in the center and surrounds from red and green cones and blue cones. Yeah? So therefore, they concluded that if there is a deficit in performance like this, uh, that must reflect the fact that the parasol system plays an important role in the analysis. But as I told you before, stereopsis is processed predominantly by the midget system, and so is texture. So that raised quite a problem. And so people began to run experiments in which they recorded from uh, the parasol system to see what happens actually to unit responses when you are at isoluminance. And that resulted in quite a surprise. Okay? So here is an example of a magnocellular cell, meaning a cell that gets input from the parasol system of the retina. And you alternate between red and green here, repeatedly, 
collect the data, and you vary the red-green ratio. Okay? And you can see here that uh, throughout the whole thing, this cell continues to respond. So that became quite a puzzle. You, you're not able to silence the magnocellular system at isoluminance. Uh, so uh, the question is, how come? Well, the answer is, as you had seen before, that the parasol system is extremely sensitive. It gets input even in the center of it, the receptive field of each cell for many of, uh, or I should maybe say several, uh, different uh, cones. And because of that, there's much more information and, and excitation coming into those cells than into those that are in the midget system that most of which only get input from a single cone in for the center. So that being the case, then, uh, we can move on and ask the question, well, what about if you do the same kind of experiment in area MT? Now, who remembers? Area MT gets most, most of its input from which system? Good. Mostly from the parasol system going through the magnocellular layers. So now you can record in area MT and do the same kind of experiment I just described to you for uh, the retina and the lateral genital nucleus. And so what you can do here is that you have a monkey, the monkey fixates, and you move a bar of, uh, of light across the receptive field back and forth, which is isoluminant, red-green in this case, okay? And then you see how, th how well the cell responds. And then for comparison, what you can do is you can use a luminance grading, okay, brighter and darker than the background, uh, to which we know that the uh, uh, parasol cells and the cells in the uh, um, area MT respond vigorously. So now we are going to compare what the difference is between these two conditions, meaning luminance grading as opposed to uh, an isoluminant color grading. So if you do that experiment, you're in for a surprise. Here's an example of one cell in which there's a much more vigorous response to luminance. Here are the various uh, luminance contrasts. Okay, and here's a chrominance one. And the cell doesn't respond as well here, but it still responds reasonably well. Then you take another cell, and you get the opposite. In this particular cell, still in area MT, responds a bit more vigorously to chrominance than to luminance. And so if you add this all up and record from many, many cells, you find that the cells in area MT, just like in the lateral genital nucleus and in the retina, respond quite well at isoluminance. The parasol cells, the, uh, the cells, the same cells, of course, in the lateral genital nucleus, and in area MT. So this area, MT, uh, is one that responds surprisingly well to anything that's out there that results in a change, whether the change is produced by virtue of chrominance or by virtue of luminance. And that, in fact, is one of the very important uh, attributes of uh, the parasol system, namely, that it's, and that's, why, that's so numerous in the periphery, is to be able to detect just about anything that happens, motion, flicker, uh, uh, just the onset of a single stimulus, whatever. But that system is very sensitive and can tell, oh, something has happened there. All right? That's what that system is very good for. It's not that good, obviously, for seeing very, very fine detail, but it's very sensitive and it's very, very good for detecting motion and appearances. All right, so now uh, we're going to move on and talk about a topic that I'm sure many of you have an interest in and that has to do uh, with deficiencies in color, often referred to as color blindness. And uh, the first fact is that if you look at the incidence of color deficits in humans, Eight out of 100 males uh, among Caucasians, five in 100 in Asians, three in 100 in Africans. In females, it's much, much less. It's 10 times less frequent. But still, overall, that's, that's quite a number of people who have 
some sort of deficiency in color. So now that we know that, we can ask the next question. What kinds of color deficits can we denote? And the type, these are given fancy names, uh, which are called protonopes, deuteronopes, and tritonopes. And that simply refers to the fact that protonopes lack uh, long wavelength cones, which are, of course, the red cones. The deuteronopes lack medium wavelength cones, which are green ones. The tritonopes lack the short wavelength cones, which are the blue ones. So that is the basic types of deficits. Now, some people have a combination of these. Some people uh, have no color vision at all, but that's very rare. Um, quite common are uh, the, uh, the, these three types. You, have th you, you somehow don't have one particular kind of cone, or you have very few of them, or they, 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 they're something. You have them, but they don't function right. OK, so now, how do we establish our ability to see colors and whether we have normal color vision. Now, that's very interesting. A number of tests have been developed. And the most famous of those, the oldest one, let me go back, sorry, uh, are the so-called Ishihara plates. And the next one is the farnsworth munsell hue test. And the third one I'm going to tell you about is the dynamic computer test. OK, so let's look at the Ishihara plates. OK, if you look at that, uh, how many of you can see what, the, what, the, what, what is written there? OK, what, what is it? Eight. Eight. Very good. Anybody doesn't see it? OK, you don't see that. OK, we'll, we'll get back to you in a minute. All right. So now, uh, another test is a, a dynamic one. The reason for using a dynamic test is that uh, <coughs> The so-called isoluminant point of individuals is not the same. There's a lot of variation from person to person. And so this test is the dynamic one. They present it for the background. As you can see here, uh, different luminance levels in gray. And when the computer starts running, these keep exchanging each other in randomized fashion. So it's a dynamic view. And then you have a central area here. Everybody can read this, right? What's the word? Light. Very good. So now instead of presenting these uh, letters here in a bright, high brightness overall, we can present them in color. So I'm now going to show you an easy test. Uh, anybody can read this? Anybody who cannot read it? Can you read it? Uh, ish. Ish. <laughs> OK. So what's the word? What? MIT, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so now I'm going to make it more difficult. You guys ready? What is this one? Fit. Are you having a? Yeah, it's a little harder. Oh, you're having a fit, huh? Well, can, you <laughs> uh, can you read that one? No. No. <laughs> OK. All right, so now it seems like we do have one person here who has a, perhaps a mild color deficiency. And so now the question comes up. For, even if all of you want to do this, what can you do to test yourself? OK? Well, so let me tell you about that. There is a so-called farnsworth monsell color test. So what you want to do here is, can you read this down here? Uh, get, on, uh, get on Google, OK? And just type in farnsworth monsell color test uh, online. If you type that in, all kinds of things come up. You click on the topmost one, and then what you see here is a set of uh, colors, actually the fourth sets. And each of this has 20 in it. I just drew a few of them in. And your task is then to take each of these can be moved to arrange them in, in an order, all right? Going from this color to that color in order. So you do that for all four of them. And after you did that, you can click on the bottom and it will tell you what your score is for each of these. Okay? And so if your color vision is very good, then you go, it, gives you, it gives you sort of a set of histograms. And if the histogram is very, very low, then you're good. And if it's high, then you're not. F what you can actually do is, when you first, this first comes on, these are in random order. Your task is to, task is to put them in order. But when it, at the bottom here, it, it says score. 
So if you click on score, it will give you the, uh, the histograms uncorrected, and they're all going to be high. Then you do this work, and then you click on it again and see how good your color vision is based on that. It's a bit time consuming, uh, but if you are interested in getting a sense of how, just how good your color vision is, this is, a, this is a rather good test, which is readily available on the internet. OK, does anybody have any questions about uh, this, this portion? OK, good. So now, um, as a result of this, we're going to move on and spend the uh, remainder of our time talking about adaptation, because that is pretty closely relevant, as we shall see, uh, to color vision as well. OK, so when we talk about adaptation, first of all, again, we come up with a number of basic facts. Now, let me, at this point, interject and just tell you that um, all the material I'm talking about today will be posted on Stellar. But what's on Stellar now is, is not an updated version. But what I'm talking about today will be on Stellar, I think, by tomorrow. OK? All right, so basic facts. We talk about overall levels of illumination. That's what's so remarkable about the visual system. It's actually unbelievable, 10 log units overall. OK? But the reflected light varies over a much smaller range. In other words, you don't want to look at directly at light. OK? The reflected light varies only about 20-fold. All right? So now the question is, how do we handle this? Well, it turns out that the pupil, which does play a role in this, uh, can only adjust over a range of 16 to 1. All right? So that's a long cry from 10 log units. And so much of the adaptation, I would say even most of the adaptation that takes place, occurs in your photoreceptors, OK? So here I'm say, saying this again. Most light adaptation takes place in the photoreceptors. Now, how does it take place? Well, the way it takes place is that I mentioned this to you before. The photoreceptor molecules, like rhodopsin in, in, in the rods, comes in two basic forms. You don't need to know the, uh, uh, the chemistry of it. What you need to know simply that it comes in two forms. We can call it bleached and unbleached. Some people call it open and closed. Okay, But let's call it bleached and unbleached. At any level of illumination, this is a very dynamic process. At any level of illumination, uh, a certain percentage of, of, of molecules is bleached in each, in each receptor, and a certain number is not bleached. And the brighter the illumination, the more are bleached. Okay? It's dynamic, but, but, but which I mean is that the molecules come, constantly keep changing. So it's the percentage, overall percentage, of the ratios between the bleached and the unbleached. Okay? So that means that any increase in the rate of which quanta are delivered to the eye results in a proportional decrease in the number of pigment molecules available to absorb those quanta because they are bleached. Okay? Now, this arrangement um, happens to be extremely clever. And this is reflected in the fact uh, that the retinal ganglion cells they are sensitive to local contrast differences. Remember, I told you there's a center surround organization. This is one of the prime reasons we have that, OK? Uh, they, they respond, the overwhelming majority, like 95% of the cells in the retina, the uh, retinal ganglion cells, respond to contrast differences, not to absolute levels of illumination. And that's why we often talk about contrast. And if you remember what the contrast formula is, it's the uh, contrast level uh, of the stimulus itself uh, and, the, and the contrast level of the background. You subtract one from the other, divided by the sum of the two, multiply by 100. I, I showed that, that to you before. OK, so now here we are. If you talk about light and dark adaptation, this is the basic uh, outline of the retinal connections that we had talked about. We had presented this several times before. And then if you are light adapted, you essentially 
have non-functional rods, so I took them off here. But then when you dock adapted, the opposite happens, and you have the rods active, OK? But they all feed into the same ganglion cells, and that's why at night the receptive fields are bigger, and you don't see color at night because this is what the picture is. Now, what you can do is, let's ask the question, how do the new neurons, like the uh, cells in the retina, the retinal ganglion cells, how do they fire at different levels of illumination? And that's quite an interesting story and a very straightforward one. Here we have a cell that had been adapted to uh, these different levels of illum background illumination. Okay, uh, At minus 5, your, your rods are functional. And what is important to see here is that as you change quite dramatically the background level, the eye adapts. And I should say that it's the photoreceptors predominantly that do so. And what they look at are local differences. And so each of these then sees afresh uh, the contrast uh, that is created rather than looking at absolute illumination levels. And that's what you want, of course. You want to be able to drive well at night. You want to be able to drive well in the daytime. And by having this system, you can look at predominantly at uh, contrast differences rather than absolute levels of contrast. So that's the arrangement here. And now what we are going to do is to uh, move on and talk about the so-called after effects of adaptation. Okay. So let me tell you how this initially was done. <clears throat> People ask the question, what happens if I fix something on your retina for a period of time? If the previous set of data I'd shown you is correct, if I present something to the retina and leave it there, pretty soon you won't see anything, right? So a famous series of experiments was done by now many, many years ago, in which they, very clever experiment, they had subjects lie down, and they put a contact lens in the eye. And in the contact lens, they put in a miniature, put a miniature projector on, OK? Which meant that when you turn that projector light on, it went to a fixed position on the retinal surface. Why was this necessary? Well, the reason it happened is because it was discovered that your eye actually is not really stable on purpose. Your eye has a so-called eye tremor. Okay? And of course, you move, move your eyes all the time. So this procedure of having a contact lens with a, with a projector attached to it kind of got rid of the eye tremor. Okay? So when they did that, they found that within a matter of depending on the contrast, within a matter of a minute or less, maybe even 30 seconds, uh, you would stop seeing what was presented to the eye. Okay? Because you then uh, change the adaptation level in your photoreceptors. So then subsequently, people had a clever idea, said, we don't need to go to this incredible trouble of having to have people uh, with contact lenses and a projector and having them lie down because that's the only way it would work. We can do this much more simply. And so to do that, I'm going to have a demonstration here. OK, what I would like each of you to do is to, you see it's a light spot here and a dark spot there, right? So I want you to fixate here and count to about 30. And, after, and be very relaxed about it. This is a Gaussian, therefore the, there's no sharp edge and the eye tremor doesn't matter. Then after you count it to 30, shift your gaze to the bottom one. The first thing that happens if you keep looking at it, the two ones on top will disappear, OK, if you fix it very tightly. And once they dis disappear, then you can look down. Everybody see it disappear? Good. And what happens when you looked at the bottom? You got a reversal, right? You got a dark spot here and a light spot here. You say, oh my god, what's going on here? <laughs> OK, so now let's do another experiment. I want you to do this again, but what I want you to do is to cover one eye up. 
and then do it again count to 30. And after you did so, make a saccade on the bottom, but switch your eye. OK? And if you the switch the eye, keep cover the one that you looked at and, and uncover the one that you didn't look at, OK? And if you do that, you won't get any effect. So what does that prove? That proves that this is happening in the retina. OK, everybody agree? Very clear cut. OK, so what's going on here? So let's diagram this. Here we have the situation. We turned on these two stimuli, OK? And when, when we turned it on, Initially, the sensitivity of your photoreceptors was pretty much the same because it was a homogeneous background. Then, after you looked at this for a while, no, one more thing. In this case, the on cells fired, and in this case, the off cells fired, saying, oh, dark spot, oh, light spot. Now, if you keep looking at this for a while, what happens is it begins to disappear. When it does, what happens is you don't see anything. And what happens also is that the sensitivity here decreases for white light and the increases here for white light. So therefore, what happens is once you adapt it to this, there's no response in the letter in, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the ganglion cells. Then for the third step, when you made, look, made yourself look down, you have a homogeneous background, but this region is less and this region is more sensitive. And so therefore, the photons that come that it, come into your eye from those two regions, hit more and less sensitive regions uh, on the retinal surface, thereby activating the opposite cells, here activating the uh, off cells, here activating the on cells. Uh, sorry. Uh, right, yeah. You get a reversal. So that explains why you see the after image, OK? So now we're going to continue and get back to the question of the color circle. See what happens with after images with color. All right, so this color circle is unbelievably powerful because it explains the after images that you see with color. And I, I will come back to this circle. But what I want you to do now, again, is to fixate here. Uh, count till again about 30, and then fixate on the bottom. So if you do that, I think most of you should see, again, a reversal. Here you would see some reddish, here you would see something gre greenish. Does everybody see that? How, do you see that too? Good. OK. So uh, you have a very minor color deficit. All right. So that's the case here. So now let me show you another one. OK. And again, do the same experiment. And what you see here at the after images you get, oops, sorry. Oops, let me go back. The after images you get here uh, are not going to be the complementaries here. So what's going on? So let me explain it to you. Here again is the color circle. Uh, and here are the prime axes. It turns out that if you adapt to this level here, the rule of the, after, of the color circle says if you go across, this is the after image you're going to see. Okay? And if you adapt to here, this is the after image you're going to see. So I, let me draw that up. It looks like that. Okay? And that is true everywhere as long as you go across the axis. You could do this horizontally or even diagonally, uh, and you get this reversal. So it says that an after image can be perfectly predicted by the rules of the color circle. It's on the opposite side uh, of the image that you look at going across the center along the cardinal axis. But now, if you do the diagonals, which I showed you before when it didn't match, what we have here, you had this and this, 
then the afterimage is this and that. And so we don't have uh, a correspondence, of course, because you're not uh, along uh, the, the uh, axes that would predict this. This one gives you that, and this one gives you that. So if I did this and this to begin with, it would be the same as that, but rotated. Okay, So that then uh, clearly enables us to use the color circle to predict not only some of the basic effects of what colors we see, but also to tell you exactly what kinds of after images you get. Quite remarkable. OK, so now to drive this home once more. This is, doesn't work too well because the colors are crummy here, but we can try. Everybody agree this is sort of a more or less black and white display? A little bluish, unfortunately, here, uh, of a beautiful castle. So now what I want you to do, see that fixation spot here? What I want you to do here is to fixate here, again, count till 30, and then I'll switch back to it. And if this were to work right, you would see that the uh, original black and white image in color. Keep fixating, uh, I'll count till 20 more, and then I'll switch back. Did, did you see the colors? <laughs> yeah. So this is a very clever demo. I'm, I'm afraid I don't remember the person's name who came up with this one. Uh, but the essence of it is, again, that indeed what is happening is that you're creating an after effect due to adaptation in the retina. And when you do this very cleverly, like this, this particular <coughs> castle picture, you can actually create an artificial impression of colors which are in consonance with what the real colors would look like in a black and white figure. OK, so that then is the essence of what I want to cover about adaptation. And we can now come and summarize what I had covered today. So first of all, I told you that there are three qualities of color, hue, brightness, and saturation. And uh, just to go back, to, hang on for a minute. I want to go back once more to make this clear, all right, which I didn't forgot to mention. If you go around the circle, you change hue, OK? And if you go from the periphery to the center, you change saturation, OK? And the center here, if this color circle were 100% correct, this would be a, a, a white area. Yeah. OK. Now, the basic rules of color vision are explained by the color circle, as we had amply seen. It is something probably, I have a color circle up on my wall in my office because uh, I'm always fascinated by this, even though I've been doing it for years. All right. So the three photoreceptors we talked about in humans and in primates, the red, green, and blue, which shouldn't be called that. They, people get mad when you do that, even though that's the way I call it. But people want to call them short, medium, and long wavelength. Uh, cones, uh, they are broadly tuned as I'd shown you in those uh, spectrograms. Uh, the color upon midget retinal ganglion cells form two cardinal axes, the red, green, and the blue, yellow. Okay? And those, if you remember, I told you in the, uh, at the level of the retinal ganglion cells and at the level of the lateral geniculate nucleus uh, fall into these two major categories. We don't have any on the diagonals. So for us to be properly able to see diagonals, that's done somewhere in the cortex. It's not done at the level of the retina or the lateral geniculate nucleus. OK. Now, I also pointed out to you several times already that the midget system is essential for color discrimination. Uh, and the parasol cells uh, can see stimuli even at isoluminance. OK. They just cannot say what the color is. They don't, quote, perceive different colors. But they can see the, uh, any kind of change that occurs in the environment, even when it occurs at isoluminance. Color is processed in many cortical areas. Lesions to any single 
extra stride area fails to eliminate the processing of chrominance information. It can reduce it, but it doesn't block it out. That's true for many things. Uh, so the cortical areas are very, very complex, and they do interactive analysis for many different attributes, including color. However, I can add here that it does not apply to area MT, because MT does not seem to be specializing in color, because lesions there you don't count any deficit. But there are several other visual areas. We went through that, V3 and infratemporal cortex and so on. They, these areas contribute to the processing of color. Now, the perception of isoluminance is categorized for all categories of vision. It's not selective to only those that are processed by the uh, midget or the parasol systems. All aspects of vision, and the, uh, the three I showed you was stereopsis, motion, uh, and what, what was the third one? Te texture. Texture, right. So uh, all three of those are compromised um, when stimuli presented at isoluminance. The most significant aspect of luminance adaptation occurs in the photoreceptors, and it's explainable by the relative number at any given level of adaptation of bleached and unbleached uh, photoreceptor molecules, uh, as in the case of rhodopsin. Lastly, after images are a product of photoreceptor adaptation and their subsequent response to incoming light. So that then is the essence of what uh, we wanted to cover today. And I hope you did find uh, this interesting, because certainly our ability to see color is quite a remarkable thing. It's amazing to uh, get a sense of how the nervous system does that, even though at this stage we are, we are still at a fairly early level of having gained full understanding of it. Now the next time we are going to move on to another fascinating topic, at least for me fascinating, which is depth perception, which I had mentioned before, uh, is a remarkable achievement because images fall on a two-dimensional retinal surface. And from that, the third dimension has to be reconstructed. And how that is done, we are going to discuss the next time. All right, now let's make sure that all of you have had signed attendance. And the next thing is, if any of you have any questions, I will be happy to try to answer them. Oh, so once again, I'm crystal clear, huh? <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for attending. And I do hope that uh, your knowledge has increased a bit about how we process color information.